Hello world, welcome to this Hi-Fi 101. I haven't made a Hi-Fi 101 video in ages, but welcome to this video on digital music files, and hopefully I've easily explained it for you. Well, hello world. Or bad boy Marky, or just plain Mark. Okay, so how are digital files expressed? Well, what you see below, 16 bit, 44.1 kilohertz, is how you see digital files expressed. In other words, by a bit rate, followed by a slash, and then uh, a number in kilohertz. And I'll explain what that means a bit later on. OK, let's just deal with the bit rate business first. OK, so first of all, counting in binary. Counting in binary is different from our normal decimal counting. Uh, kids at school are taught place value. Units, tens, hundreds, thousands and so on. And when they first start doing their sums, you'll see them putting as a header um, TU, for example, if they're adding in tens and units to remind them that they are adding in tens and units, for example. Okay, binaries a little bit different from that. Okay, I've got a little chart here. And rather than putting hundreds, tens and units at the top, here is a 16 digit uh, binary system here so it's 16 bits okay and any number can be expressed as a permutation of noughts and ones and so i've decided to count up to 16 here going down the left here okay so for one you will find that there is a one in the ones column OK, now this, the, these columns double, OK, so two is double one, four is double two, eight is double four and so on. So our number one is a one in the ones column and zeros everywhere else. Two is a zero in the ones column because we haven't got any ones now. We've got one, two, OK and then zeros everywhere else, okay? For three, you've got one in the ones column and a one in the twos column because we've got one two and one one and then zeros everywhere else, okay? So that by the time we get up to 15, we've got one plus two plus four plus eight. So we've got ones in all those four columns and zeros everywhere else. And 16 is one in the 16th column and then zeros everywhere else, okay? Um, and you can count quite high in binary, actually. 16-bit um, binary will let us get to 65,535 when we're just counting, okay? Now, what a CD player or no, let's change that. When you're recording in digital, in 16-bit digital, every sound is converted to a number between naught and 65,535. Okay, so it has a theoretical limit there in that if a sound is more complex than that, Maybe it's louder, maybe it's a higher sound or a lower sound than uh, can be expressed in naught to 65,535. There's a limit, okay? Um, modern recording systems for digital use 24-bit, which means you can actually count up to the millions, which is a higher resolution, okay? But you can think of this, this bits figure as a bit like megapixels on uh, a digital camera, for example, okay? Where if you've got all 
a one megapixel picture and you try and enlarge that even to the size of today's uh, sort of HD screens and whatnot, you're going to find that it looks like it's been made out of Lego bricks. That's to do with the bit rate or, 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 or the bits number of our 16 bit 44.1 kilohertz. So here's an analog waveform for you. Okay, you have to forgive my drawings and you'll have to forgive the low resolution, i.e. low bit picture here. I had to take a photograph on my screen because for some reason I can't get my scanner to work. So this sort of mountain kind of thing here represents a sound waveform. Okay, the distance in between one peak one line and the next line represents the pitch of that note okay I don't know if you can hear there's a very high pitch siren going off outside but that would be very very close together sort of mountains on my waveform here okay so that's how high or low the sound is this first pitch where I've drawn this arrow here is actually quite a low sound and it's also quite a loud sound okay volume or amplitude is expressed in decibels okay we'll talk about those in a, in a moment pitch is expressed in hertz and kilohertz okay hertz for the very low notes once you get to a thousand of them it becomes one kilohertz okay so, so, so there are one thousand hertz in one kilohertz okay um for a quick uh, sort of, I suppose, comparison. If you're looking at a piano, the A above middle C is 440 hertz. The bottom A on a piano is 27.5 hertz, okay? If you were looking at that same waveform as being expressed in 16 bit, this is kind of my little approximation here, okay? But you can see that it's a bit like trying to enlarge our one megapixel photograph and finding out that it looks like it's made of Lego bricks, okay? And it's, it's the same here. 16 bits is not particularly high in terms of recording uh, digitally. And in fact, even in the 1970s, when the first dig digital recording experiments came out, uh, they, they actually could record to a much higher specification. It was only because the recording industry at the time in, in the early 80s was in a slump. They thought, gosh, we better get CD out quickly because we need people to trade up their record collections to these new high bit digital CDs. And they plumped for 16 bits, 44.1 kilohertz, just out of nowhere. Philips and Sony developed the CD and the digital recording thing together. Well, Philips, for example, were betting that that specification chosen would be 14 bits. And so they, the first CD player that they developed, had a 14 bit encoder in it. Sony waited a little bit and kind of knew that that specification was going to be a 16-bit one. So their first CD player, which was released um, to most of the world in March 1983, it had been released a little bit earlier at the end of 1982 in, um, in Japan. But uh, by and large that Sony was the first CD player to the market and it was a 16-bit CD player but Philips ones only had 14-bit decoders the first the first Philips CD players so as you can see it's got some wibbly wobbly bits that doesn't matter though in I suppose or at the time it didn't matter okay because its frequency range was 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, okay? Um, 
the bottom note on a piano, as I said, is about 27.5 hertz. And the E, the, the lowest E on a bass guitar is tuned to a fifth above that. So it should, in theory, be able to capture any sound that any musical instrument could make from the lowest to the very highest. The problem is um, that although people can't hear above 20 kilohertz, and in fact, most adults, their hearing drops off in time. And say an adult of about my age, which is pushing on 50, my hearing is probably only about 15 or 16 kilohertz at best. Um, but people know when sounds above that are being made, okay? It's only our ears that are kind of protecting us from certain things. Um, for example, going back down to the, to the lowest pitches that we can hear, if we could hear more than 20 hertz, then we would be deafened by changes in the weather because basically there are lower sounds and louder sounds, our ears are not very sensitive down at that very low level or at the very high level. But there would be certain sounds that we could hear that are there and they're going on, but that we're just not sensitive to. One of those things is reverberation and another thing is harmonics. So when an instrument is playing its top notes, it will also be giving off harmonics, which are notes that are based on the same scale of the note that is being played but it's, it's what gives a violin its tone and a clarinet its tone and a synthesizer its tone okay and we are very sensitive to that okay so by this 16-bit limitation of 20 to 20 you are kind of saying right well actually you know, that 16-bit thing, it cannot record anything other than that. And we are sensitive to higher pitches. We are also sensitive to lower pitches. But most amplifiers on the market, and this is another thing, which we'll get onto a bit later. It's another sort of link in the chain, another variable in the chain, really. But most amplifiers in the 70s couldn't reproduce anything other than 20 to 20 either so by the 70s standards it was a good standard it's dynamic range now dynamic range and signal to noise ratio are not exactly the same but they are pretty much the same for all intents and purposes you can use dynamic range and signal to noise ratio interchangeably what dynamic range means is the difference between the highest sound that can be recorded and played back without distorting and the quietest sound that can be played without noise of the machine or tape hiss or vinyl hum or whatever drowning out the quietest sound okay with with CD, that was theoretically 96 decibels, okay? Now, plus um, or minus three decibels represents either doubling or halving of a, a, a volume level, okay? An amplitude level, in other words, okay? So, although theoretically CD could achieve 96 decibels in practice, it was more like 90 decibels, which was still quite high, but it was a quarter of that 96 decibels, okay? So a fourth of the volume of that 96 decibels was the difference between the loudest it can go without distorting, the quietest it can go without getting drowned out in, uh, in electrical hum and hiss and whatnot else, okay? All right, to compare that, a metal tape cassette now, this is, these are the specifications of my Yamaha KX580 when playing a, a metal tape, okay? Um, the Yamaha KX580 was a good machine. It wasn't a Nakamichi, though, and Nakamichi tapes 
uh, tape decks could probably achieve better, but this is a very good figure. On a metal tape cassette, the frequency range was typically 20 to 20. Uh, signal to noise ratio when using Dolby S noise reduction, which came out towards the end of the cassette's life, sadly, and uh, most commercial tapes didn't use it. Most, most commercial tapes used Dolby B, and they used either chrome or ferric tape, which kind of brought the figures down. But, you know, the best it could do was basically 20 to 20 with the signal to noise ratio of 80 decibels, which still was nowhere near um, CD, even in practice, let alone theoretically. Um, and when you played it with Dolby B noise reduction, a, a metal tape with Dolby B noise reduction, your, um, your signal to noise ratio was reduced even more to 68 decibels. But that's cassette, okay? Analog reel to reel playing at 30 IPS, I haven't got any figures for that, but it would be much better than a metal tape cassette probably more like CD figures. Now, this sampling rate, this is the 44.1 bit of our 16-bit 44.1, okay? Now, inside every CD player, there's a DAC, that's called a DAC, or a Digital to Audio Converter, okay? When you're recording, you will have the same thing in reverse, an analog, to digital recorder. In other words, analog, let's pretend it's sound, okay? Just sound that you hear when you're sort of walking out in the street and people talking to you and stuff. Let, that, that's analog sound for all intents and purposes, okay? So to record it, you would take the analog sound, you will convert that into a 16-bit digital number, and then, um, on playback, that 16-bit number has to be converted to analog, i.e. sound, before it can be passed to an amplifier and speakers, okay? Um, and that's what a DAC is, okay? So that 44.1 kilohertz represents how many times in a second it does that job. In other words, at 44,000 times a second, your CD player is grabbing a 16-bit number, converting it to sound, grabbing another 16-bit number, converting it to sound, and so on, 44,000 times a second. It sounds like a very busy job, and indeed it is. The thing is that that creates one heck of a lot of noise and that noise is actually audible. So all digital to analog converters incorporate a filter. And that filter basically separates the sound we want to hear from that sampling noise that we don't want to hear. The thing is that 44.1 kilohertz sounds a heck of a lot, sounds very fast indeed, and it is very fast indeed, but it's not fast enough for that filtering to uh, have to be quite radical in order to do it. And that radical filtering is something that, again, people say they can hear. It, they wouldn't necessarily know, oh, I'm being plagued by 44.1 kilohertz filtering noise. You don't know that except that you feel it, okay? It's, it's just not quite comfortable, okay? So if you can somehow or other kid the, the CD and, and, the, and the digital analog converter into believing that it should be doing it at a faster rate, you can make that filter a lot less steep a lot less radical and the sound a lot better a lot easier to listen to and this is what in the in the sort of late 80s to mid 90s people were going on about these four times over sampling cd players philips in particular and cd 
players based on the Philips design in particular use what's called a four times over sampling technique whereby instead of using 44.1 kilohertz per second they actually multiplied that by four to get this 176.4 kilohertz uh, over sampling thing but it was basically only the equivalent of I suppose taking a three megapixel camera and doing a bit of guesswork to think oh what would that picture look like at six megapixels and there were cameras around that did that at the time they were interpolating cameras that basically kidded you by making up me uh, pixels based on closest matches and stuff like that they actually managed to get a better quality picture especially at enlarged rates than uh, a three megapixel one it wasn't as good as a natural proper six megapixel sensor but it was better than three megapixels and this is the same with this oversampling thing it wasn't as good as today's 24-bit 192 digital to analog converters but it was certainly better than 44.1 kilohertz there's the picture of the very first sony cd player the cdp 101 there basically <clears throat> just doing its job basically reading a cd at 16 bits and converting it uh to analog at 44.1 kilohertz 44,100 times a second basically okay um this is my cd player actually this is the rega saturn r it basically instead of having one dac it's got two one for each channel um because this was another thing you see these first cd players have one dac for both channels and cheaper cd players now and the sound cards in computers and stuff like that they've basically got one dac in there for both channels okay um by having two it makes the whole job a lot easier takes the stress out of it and by by that it also means it takes the stress out of listening to the sound by doing that and also nowadays you can't get uh standard what's called red book the 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 cd standard was called the red book standard and you can't get standard uh 16 bit 44 dacs anymore even for use in cd players you you have to use uh the, today's uh, DACs which were developed for DVD actually but when used in a CD player what you can actually do again is more of this interpolation business in other words you can take a 16-bit CD you can kid the CD player that it's actually reading a 24-bit file it will interpolate it to 24 bits and then it will basically then convert that okay so you you can actually get a, a better sound out of it and the cd section of the um the riga saturn r because it's basically it's also got a built-in uh dac as well that you can actually access so you can plug in computers playstations dvd players everything else and just and, and use its own DAC and then you can get some higher figures out of it but essentially for the CD playing section of this uh, it's got uh, it will go down to 17 Hertz which is below that 20 Hertz of the original CD specification might not sound very much it's probably only about a semitone or something like that below the the lowest notes that the old CD players could, pl could could reproduce but it just feels it's, it's having an easier job of producing those sounds that we can hear okay and again 
it goes up to 20.5 kilohertz. It's a little bit more, okay? The signal to noise ratio is 109 decibels. Even if you were gonna say that, that that's an in theory figure, it's still higher than CDs in theory figure. Um, and essentially, it just means that music sounds a lot easier when played via this. And I can actually vouch for that, having gone through upgrade after upgrade after upgrade to get to something like this Saturn R player. And, but believe you me, this Saturn R player is expensive. It's £1,700. So, you know, that's, that's one heck of a lot of money. Um, but most digital audio producing equ equipment doesn't sound anywhere near as nice as, as this. It has to be said, OK? But I'm not here to advertise Riga. What, what I'm trying to do is just try and kind of explain how far the technology has come, OK? Because we have this, the absolute sublime, and now we're going on to the ridiculous, and I forgot to build in the bullet points here, so you're gonna to have to look at the whole thing. But when you're talking about ripping, downloading, and sharing files, let's just have a little look at the technology. By ripping, what we mean is taking a CD, putting it into a CD player that's connected to your uh, laptop or computer, they used to have them built in, but nowadays to get them smaller, they tend not to. But if you want to then play that music back via your computer or via a device, such as a tablet or something like that, then you would rip it. In other words, you copy it onto a computer. Downloading, I'm talking about now downloading services such as Apple Music or um, iTunes or Spotify and sharing by which I mean perhaps emailing your friends or something but you would never email something hopefully that's copyrighted now would you okay so this is like your own files that I'm talking about here okay and you have the power here there's a lot of settings and things that you can change to make sure that for whatever purpose you're using it for you're getting the best sound quality. One of the biggest figures to note here is a figure that's um, that's called KBPS. That stands for kilobits per second, okay? And this is to do with the compression um, that the original CD file, and we are talking CD here, because there is nothing that can play a native 24192 file in just music, okay? Um, there used to be, there used to be high resolution players like DVD-A, which was DVD audio, and SACD, but now we don't have that, okay? You can, you can get them on the internet, you can get those files on the internet, but trying to find software that can actually play it natively is very difficult, okay? I've got uh, an album, which I downloaded from HD Tracks, that's what it was. Um, but iTunes software can only play that back at 1644, even though it's 2496. So, yeah, you know, it, 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 it's difficult, okay? But this compression number here basically means taking a CD or a song from a CD and squashing it to a smaller size so that it's easily storable on, on a hard drive and quick to download or to stream, okay? Um, they're still not really streaming and making commercially available full 16-bit files. And it's a bit sad, really, that given that I've just spent the majority of this video talking about the limitations of 1644, Actually, sound quality is worse than CD via the internet, which is where most of us get our music. But this KBPS number, the higher that number is, the 
the less compression it's had. Okay, and the less compression, compression basically means throwing away data that some algorithm believes we can't hear. For example, when I first started downloading music, now I'm talking about, I suppose, the mid noughties, 2004, something like that, when I first discovered the Windows Music Store, as it, as, as it was, that was run by Microsoft and is no longer... I don't think I I I don't know uh, basically where people get their music from just to play on a Microsoft computer. But essentially, it was one hundred and twenty-eight kbps. It was a WMV file at one hundred and twenty-eight kbps. It meant that Apple computers couldn't play it because it was WMV, which was Windows' own proprietary format. And 128 kbps meant very little in the way of dynamic range when it meant bright, horrible treble and, and boomy bass such as there was, okay? It was really very, very poor. And Apple, Apple's own AAC iTunes 128 kbps sounded a little bit smoother in comparison, but was still very poor. The first kind of file type that existed for uh, downloading was of course the infamous mp3 file. Okay I say in infamous because there was a company called Napster uh, which was essentially uh, at the time some sort of pirating uh, website sort of thing. I don't believe in pirating, I believe in paying musicians by the way for what they produce and very very little of of this of the music that you'll find in my home is anything other than legal and i would encourage you to do the same because i believe that musicians have to earn a living too and you know given that they have such a fight trying to get any money out of a record company um it, to deprive them of the tiny little bit that they get from these downloading services and stuff like that is immoral, really. This, uh, the MP3 is a universal file. It will play on just about anything on this planet that is designed to uh, play music digitally, okay? So that means that you can get a, disc, a CD of MP3s and play it on um, a modern CD player. I don't know whether or not that first Sony would have understood mp3 files but certainly any modern cd player will play an mp3 any software any kind of device it will play an mp3 the highest quality uh, mp3 you can get i believe is 320 kbps okay it's, it's sounds all right for most people playing back on computers and stuff like that you're not going to tell the difference okay it's only when you get them through a hi-fi that suddenly you realize that there is actually a difference between these things um apple lossless and i, I believe there was a wmv lossless as well but apple lossless is basically uh taking the music from a cd and converting it to an apple lossless file and it kind of shrinks it a little bit, but essentially, to all intents and purposes, it's lossless. Okay, there is very little difference between the the sixteen bit forty four file, because when you're talking about uh, like a, a CD, a four minute track on CD will be about, I suppose, a thousand something like that, about a thousand kpps. I've looked at um, my high res in quotes files that are in itunes that i downloaded from hd tracks and they're native 2496 even though i'm not hearing 2496 i know i'm not hearing 2496 uh but they're they're about 4000 kpps uh for a five six minute track so you know you are talking about even you know, going down to the highest MP3 to 320 kbps, you're talking about a hell of a lot of data that is just being chucked away. Um, but yeah, Apple Lossless doesn't chuck away 
anything like as much data as that. Just shrinks the file down a little bit, but it will only play on certain Apple devices. I believe that the iPod Classic, in fact, I know that the iPod Classic can play Apple lossless files, but I'm not sure so sure about iPads, mobile phones and things like that. But certainly your computer can play Apple lossless files. OK, AAC and WM, WMV are the Apple and Windows uh, commercial downloading file formats, i.e. if you are to, bu to buy from the Apple iTunes store, you're buying AAC files and you're buying them at 256 kpbs, um, which is actually very low. OK, um, and I can tell. I can tell, um, although the fact that I've got my iMac connected to the DAC of my Saturn R via USB, I can tell the difference between normal, uncompressed 16-bit 44 files and 256 kpbs AAC files. I wouldn't necessarily know sort of in a side by side comparison, but I know that those, although they sound OK, they sound lovely, really, in in the scheme of things. But, you know, how long is a piece of string? But they don't sound quite as nice and quite as sort of free from stress. And, and this and it is stress um, as normal CD files. This Ogvorbis thing I've thrown in because Spotify uses it. Spotify uses Ogvorbis files at 320 kbps and I've just read a, a comparison on uh, on the CNET website where um, apparently sound quality wise it has the edge over 256 kbps which is also not only the iTunes uh, download uh, speed but it's also Apple Music's streaming speed as well so yeah um, what I'm going to quickly do now I'm going to come out of here I'm going to go into iTunes and quickly show you how you can change your default ripping speed okay so if you go into iTunes and preferences and if you go into when a CD is inserted, and then you've got import settings here, okay? So you can pop a CD in. At the moment, I've got it using the MP3 encoder because there was a reason where I had to send some of my own music files to somebody else, and I wanted to be able to make sure they could play it. But here's the MP3 encoder. You get good quality, which is rubbish. 128 kpps high quality 160 which is crap <laughs> and higher quality 192 and the custom when you go to custom you can then get different rates here all the way from 16 kpps which must sound like a telephone all the way up to 320 kpps which is the the highest that mp3 can do and it's the highest quality there However, we go back to these import settings again. Here's the AAC encoder here. So if you wanted to, you could put a CD in and import it in Apple's own proprietary format. OK, and again, you can change the, the custom settings here to 320, should you wish. Defaults to 100, uh, 256, used to default to 128 which is really not good. You'll notice there's no WMV there because WMV is Windows' own format and Apple doesn't use it. Made life a real headache right at the beginning of the downloading revolution. It's not quite so bad now because things like Spotify, for example, use platform independent files, for example. But I don't use Spotify. I don't use Apple Music either. 
basically because I've got enough music. I, I buy vinyl, essentially. It's much nicer. So what else have we got here? The Apple lossless encoder, which I told you about. Essentially, you've got an automatic setting there. It will give you nearly the same sort of quality as a CD. And if you're just using it for your own purposes to play back on an iPod Classic or on a laptop or something like that, it would be my recommendation for people. Okay, there's the MP3 encoder again. This AFE encoder is interesting. AFE and WAV pretty similar okay um the wav format is the native format of a cd okay and again the setting there is automatic it basically will make a, a bit by bit copy of the cd to your machine so is it all worth it is it worth knowing all that i believe so yes because i believe all knowledge is power essentially so if you know that you're paying for a lower quality thing, then you might decide to go out and buy the real CD or go out and buy vinyl instead. Um, because essentially there is no better than a physical format for playing back music, there really isn't. I've spoken about the limitations of the software to be able to play back the kind of files that you want to play back it's very complicated, okay? It really is. You know, a CD player or a record player, even a cassette player, still can, even a cassette player can sound better than CD because of, of the fact that it just, analog music just sounds better. You know, sounds in the environment sound better than a, a, a bit encoded thing. And obviously the limitations of your hardware. If you're playing back through the tiny little speakers on your laptop, then it's not going to sound very good regardless of whatever file you, format you put through it. If you're playing it back through six grand's worth of amplification, then you might be hearing the best that a CD can offer given that, you know, let, let's pretend that your CD player costs six grand, i.e. something like a Riga Isis, the Riga Isis CD player, six grand, for example, not advertising them, but just for example, and six grand's worth of amplification and speakers, then you might actually hear CD at its best. Very few of us have actually ever heard CD at its best. So to try and flog you high res formats over the internet, it's only going to be as good as what you're playing it back through. Okay. And most of us don't have that. Okay. So it all becomes slightly archaic and slightly irrelevant. But I really honestly and sincerely do believe that a physical format sounds better than any download that you care to throw at a computer. It really does, even with very basic replay equipment, okay? When I say very basic, again, I don't mean a Crosley record player. I do mean something like of, of at least the level of a Riga RP1 or a project of the same sort of specification, i.e. at least you know, maybe sort of £300 on a turntable, £300 on a CD player. It's about the very base limit where hearing music actually becomes a pleasure. And that is where I will end it, because I've got a heck of a lot of editing to do with this now. See you later. Bye. How do I stop this dancing?